Hello, I'm Kim Farah, and welcome to this latest episode of Mormon Tabernacle Choir Premieres, where we get an inside peek at the latest releases of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, Orchestra at Temple Square, and Bells on Temple Square. This episode, we're going to discuss the latest release by the Choir, Orchestra, and Bells, Hallelujah. Hallelujah features guest artists Laura Osnes, Martin Jarvis, and four soloists from the Metropolitan Opera. I'm joined now by music director Mac Wilberg and associate music director Ryan Murphy to get a behind-the-scenes look at what went into creating this year's concert. Welcome to both of you, and thank you so much for coming. Each Christmas concert is just unique and special in its own right. This last year's concert is no exception because you didn't have just one artist or two artists. You had six guest artists That's on the right. program. Can you pull back the curtain just a little bit and tell me how you decide on the guest artists who will perform? Much of it is based on ideas that we have and uh, also the availability of the the artists at a particular time. And as we say, it just all seems to come together. Which comes first, the music or the artist? Both. <laughs> Both. Uh, in this particular case, that we uh, or this particular concert, we knew that we wanted to uh, do something with the story of Handel's Messiah because we have we were right in the middle of uh, doing a complete recording of that great masterwork, uh, and it just felt like that the it was the right time to do that. And of course, the the story be. Behind Messiah is is uh, almost as remarkable as the piece itself. It is, and it was quite a centerpiece of the entire concert that we'll talk about in just a little bit. But I want to start off with the very first song, Come All Ye Children Singing, based on a French carol from the early 18th century. And as I listened to the words of this song, one line stuck out to me, and we sing for him tonight. Is that one of the reasons it was chosen as the opening number? Very lucky in having a, a, a librettist who who is able to tailor texts for what we need them for. In this particular case, it was David Warner who often writes uh, uh, lyrics for us. And uh, yes, he, he, he tailor-made that lyric for the occasion. I should say, Kim, that the, the, the tune of this carol may not be familiar to most people, I I was in Paris uh, last fall, and I have always known that there are some great French Christmas carols, but I never felt like I had access to them, or I, I couldn't find them. And and so while I was in Paris, I visited the the music store of Paris and started uh, uh, digging around a little bit, as I often do, and found two collections of. Uh, French Christmas carols, and I was not disappointed. There were, there are just a lot of great Christmas carols that that are not familiar to us, and this particular tune was among those, and that's why I selected this this tune. And then I asked David to take the the original French, and then of course make his own uh, paraphrase on on. The French text. And I remember Mac bringing that into me after that trip and saying, this is a great tune. Will you give me a, little, a rough translation of what this R is? Ryan, and, Ryan knows French very well. And, uh, so I, I wish I a, did, but I don't. I so gave him a rough translation, and then David took it and made a beautiful English version of it, which is just, just for our concert, which is fantastic. And one of the things you both do so well is introduce the public to these beautiful hidden treasures that have been around for centuries in many cases and make them so accessible to people of today. Well, there, there, is, a, there is a huge treasury of, of great uh, Christmas music that, that we often don't hear. So that's part of our, uh, well, I should say part of the, the fun of doing this. Let's listen now to Come All Ye Children Singing. We 
hear again that concluding line, and we sing for him tonight. The processional, which came next, set the tone, I thought, for the entire program, and it was a bit unusual. It was unusual uh, in in many respects, and uh, but we always say different can be good. And in this case, we uh, I was a little nervous about it simply because it was very different, but it seemed to be received very, very well. It was, and I think the audience knew immediately when they heard that chanting melody of the Father's love begotten. And then the dancers didn't dance. They came down in a very reverent way, holding lights, dressed in the costumes from different ages in history. Yes. I think it really let people know as they heard these beautiful soloists from the Met. I was going to say that that, that was... One of several things that made it different was the inclusion of four of our soloists, as you already said, who were from the Metropolitan Opera. You know, you really almost have to see the processional to appreciate it in its totality. But let's listen to Of the Father's Love Begotten. was Aaron Morley, Ben Bliss, Tamara Mumford, and Tyler Simpson, dressed in period costume. And I think we all knew we were in for something that was really going to be quite remarkable and almost on a sacred scale. Yes. And then Broadway star Laura Osnes came out. And again, with this come right. type of right. a message that we had seen in the two first, first numbers, hers, come all ye faithful. How was that selected for her? I had a conversation with uh, Laura as we were uh, deciding what might be some possibilities for her to sing, and I just threw out that particular carol as a as a possibility, and she said immediately, yes, I'd like to do Oh, Come All You Faithful. And she has such a wonderful stage presence. She really she radiates does. I mean, when she's on the stage. She, she's a pro- professional in, ev- in every sense of the word. She very much charmed audiences as she had six months prior in the Pioneer Day concert. Here's Laura Osna singing, O Come All Ye Faithful. The music then turned to Do You Hear What I Hear? What you don't know is this is my favorite Christmas carol. It's interesting that in all of our Christmas uh, concerts, we've never used that particular uh, Christmas song. And uh, we've talked about it a we number of times. We have talked about it a couple of times, but it never seemed to be quite the, the, right, the right time. And so, again, I threw out, threw out the idea uh, to Laura of that particular uh, uh, Christmas song, and she, again, was very enthusiastic about it. And interestingly enough, uh, uh, Mike, Michael Davis, who has uh, written quite a few uh, arrangements for us over the years, I called Mike and, and, and asked him how he would feel about doing an arrangement of Do You Hear What I Hear? And he said, I already have one. And so, uh, so I thought, terrific, but I didn't realize how great of an arrangement it was until we got it. It's, it's really uh, the combination of the choir and the orchestra, of course, and Laura, and then uh, Mike Davis's uh, beautiful arrangement. It, it was, uh, again, uh, I think a highlight of the evening. One of the things I enjoyed most in going back and reviewing this concert was to see how each song built upon 
the other, with the three being an invitation to come. And when you get to, do you hear what I hear? It's don't just come, it's see, it's feel, it's proclaim. And because I never get tired of hearing it, let's now listen to Do You Hear What I Hear? Way up in the sky, little lad, do you see what I see? A star, a star, dancing in the night with a tail as big as a cup. With a tail as big as a car. Ryan, the tone of the concert then turns very celebratory about spending time with family and over the river and through the wood featuring the bells on Temple Square just brought the tempo up. And you did something just fascinating rhythmically with this piece. Can you explain where that inspiration came from? Well, Mac actually approached me about writing an arrangement of this piece, and I, I have to admit, when he first asked me, I thought, really? <laughs> it seemed a little kind of square to me, but um, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, oh, this is going to be fun, and we, we did some what's called asymmetrical meter in it, which makes it feel like it's a little bit off kilter a little bit, but um, it is a change in the mood of the concert at this point. It really kind of takes a turn and becomes more up-tempo and celebratory, and, and uh, it was a lot of fun to do the arrangement, so... Should, I should also mention uh, one of the reasons that uh, that I thought this might make a a, a a good selection for this concert is that the piece that followed it, which is by Prokofiev, the Troika, there's sort of a similarity in going through, in in writing a sleigh That's right. and uh, going through the woods. If you uh, wood, I always thought it was over the river and through the too. woods. I did too. I, <laughs> I think did everybody too. did, but we found. In fact, I remember when. When uh, I saw uh, Ryan's arrangement, I said, "You've left the S off of wood," <laughs> and he said, "No, this is the correct. This is this." I want is it to be true to the original correct. in that respect. But yeah, absolutely, this goes into the the troika of Prokofiev, and that is also about sort of a horse-drawn sleigh. And so the two made a great a great pairing. Again, Max's idea to do that. So, and the audience felt with, as you called it, a. Asymmetrical, asymmetrical meter. Yeah. You felt as if you were going on this very large sleigh ride. Yeah. And then Troika is more of a, it's very playful in it a is. way, and it has that Russian it feel to it. Being it has, and it has some really song. interesting orchestration. It's got a saxophone in it, and uh, it's unusual, but uh, it's become a staple of sort of the holiday repertoire in some respects, I think. So. Yes, it's a, well, it's a well-known piece yeah. in, 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 hol in holiday repertoire, as he said. Yeah. And it really was a great opportunity to show off the talents of the orchestra oh, at Temple Square. Oh, it shows it shows off so many different aspects of the orchestra. Yeah. Well, let's first listen to Ryan Murphy's arrangement of "Over the River and Through the Wood," followed by Troika. <laughs> play to the strengths of the guest artist. And Laura Osnes, being a Broadway star in, in several productions, we know her as Cinderella, Rogers and Hammerstein's musical. And she just has one of those very clear, friendly, accessible voices. And I have to tell you, I had not heard The Secret of Christmas before. Really? I had not, but I, I have researched it, and I know it's from yeah. the 1959 musical Say One for Me, and I think she did being Crosby proud on this one. Absolutely. Yeah, it was beautiful. I mean, she has a real great way of connecting with the audience, mm -hmm. and she really delivered that song in a very 
personal touching way. It was really fun and another great arrangement, uh, beautiful string writing and, and very a nice intimate moment in the program, I mm -hmm. think. Was she the one that suggested this song? She was. She, did, yeah. she, she knew this, uh, well, she obviously knew the song, but she also knew the arrangement. And so uh, we were able to get a hold of the arranger and, and uh, be able to use the music. And we were very grateful for that. And I think that's wonderful when a guest artist brings some of their own favorites and, and some pieces to the concert that you probably wouldn't well, have considered before. That's what before. we try to do is, is a, little, a little bit of, of, of what they are familiar with and, and what might be... Uh, what you might call their trademark piece or, or selections that are they're very comfortable with. And then we always put in a, a few new things as well. And, and you're right, Ryan, it really was an intimate moment with right. her on that stage when she was singing that. And that's why she is who she is. Yeah, in fact, I think the whole first half of that was just uh, Rick Elliott at the piano and, and her singing before the orchestra came in. So it was a very nice moment. Now let's take a quick listen to The Secret of Christmas from the 1959 musical Say One For Me, sung by Laura Osnes. It's not the things you do at Christmas time, but the Christmas things you do go from that moment to this incredible medley of Christmas bells, uh, the Christmas bell fantasy medley, which featured all of our favorites, Carol of the Bell and Silver Bells. Uh, who was responsible for putting this one together? This was arranged by Sam Carden, who is another one that we uh, call upon frequently to do uh, <clears throat> writing for the choir and the orchestra. And <clears throat> as always, he did a a uh, magnificent medley of of bell songs. Once again, the concert is building up to something quite quite grand and celebratory, and as only bells can do at Christmas That's time. Right. It really is part of our tradition, and everyone participated in this piece. It was really a lot of fun for the audience to see. And here is the Christmas bell fantasy medley. Now we go, Christmas bells are ringing, caroling, caroling through the snow. Christmas bells are ringing, joyous voices sweet and clear, sing the sad of heart to cheer. Ding dong, ding dong, Christmas bells are ringing. Ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. That was just so much fun, not only to listen to Mac and Ryan, but to watch for those folks that that purchase a DVD, they're just going to have a feast for the eyes and for the ears. Now, I've waited all day to ask this question of you, Mac. Is it foom, 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 or fum, 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 and what does it mean? <laughs> well, it is foom, 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 uh, as far as I know, and I, there, there are various uh, uh, theories that, or yeah. thoughts about what it really means, but the one that I think uh, makes the most sense is it's meant to perhaps be the, the, the strumming of the guitar. Ah, okay. So, uh, and of course, it's, a, it's a, a Spanish carol, and so that, that makes sense to me. Well, it certainly is a favorite. Let's listen to Foom, Foom, Foom. One of my particular favorites from this concert is Ferrandol. Uh, Mac, I think this is a great example of how you're able to infuse these centuries-old folk tunes with these new choral arrangements to make them new favorites for a new generation. That seems to be one of your particular talents. How did you come to arrange this piece? 
Well, uh, the, the, the Ferrandal is, again, a, a standard of every orchestral player. They've, they've probably played it dozens of times and uh, uh, very well known. Uh, it's based, B Bizet used a very familiar French carol as part of that composition. And, and whenever I've heard it in the past, I always thought when that tune would come in, I would think that it'd be great if we heard that being sung. So I, 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 and I've had this idea for several years, but didn't do much about it until this particular year. And so I really sat down with the score to study it, to see if it could indeed be adapted. And I didn't do anything to the orchestral parts. The, the, the orchestral parts are completely busé. Only thing is, is that whenever the Christmas carol would come in, and he always did the Christmas Carol in its entirety. Whenever it it was uh, uh, used in in his composition, uh, I just went through and and decided this will be very easy to inject some uh, uh, choral parts, and I didn't want to take away from what Bizet had already done, uh, and so I did my. Uh, uh, my adaptation, and I felt a little bit better because in this trip I told you about to Paris, in the music store, I ran across another uh, See, there you uh, go person again. who had, in, 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 in a little different way, had, had done sort of somewhat the same thing. So I didn't feel too badly about what, what one might say polluting uh, Bizet. It's, it's such marvelous music, and I thought that it worked very well to have the voices simply... Uh, being a part of what uh, Bizet had already written, and these are also David Warner's yes, lyrics, and I of think, course, which are uh, really great. Uh, <clears throat> always going to my great friend and colleague and collaborator David Warner, who did again a masterful job of of taking that that text and making it work. And when we're talking about adapting or arranging different pieces of music, what you're doing specifically is making this music available to us through a, a 360 voice choir. Well, so it's, you're it's, having to it's change a lot. Definitely a different mm -hmm. take. And and also we had some some magnificent dancing going on at the same time. And so it was a combination of all of it. Because that that uh, that music is very, uh, even though it was it was not specifically written as dancing music, it is music. It just has a feel that it can be yeah. that it was written for dance for for a ballet, if you will, or or something else. And so it was again the, bringing the com uh, bringing all the elements together that uh, made for the for the for the success, I think, of the whole. And we do see Three Kings in full regalia. Right. At this time, the costuming, it's always wonderful for the concerts. It but is always. It was extraordinary right. here because they were they were period pieces. Yes. And so these kings were just phenomenally portrayed through the, the dancers and through their costuming. And, and it was another one of those beautiful, intimate moments where you're this this music is is bringing these emotions to you as you see these things. That's right. Kings. And we should mention Sue Allred, who has done our costumes for for many years and, and of always does. We, we can't say enough good a about terrific job. The, the terrific job that Sue does in in designing and making the costumes. I was able to go backstage and talk to her before the concerts, and the absolute thought process she goes through to create these costumes from er, the tiniest detail is, is quite extraordinary. Well, just, just seeing her artistic uh, renderings, uh, the, her drawings are beautiful art in and of themselves. And then when you see it actually realized on the stage is, is another, uh, you know, uh, always look forward to that moment. Although I actually see everything much better when we're working on the DVD because <laughs> my my attention is other places. So I really enjoy working on the DVD because I actually get to see such things as the costumes a little a little more clearly and see what everybody was seeing. 
Well, the collaborative effort, how it so seamlessly works together. It, well, is, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't work yeah. without uh, being able to collaborate with, with lots of, uh, of talented people, and we're very grateful for everyone. Let's listen to this extraordinary performance of Farindal. The concert takes us from that intimate moment with the Three Kings to the moment of Richard Elliott. And I think anyone that's ever attended one of these concerts waits to see what he is going to do, because it's always so unexpectedly delightful, if that even is a phrase that I can say. Uh, this year, he performed Let Earth Received Her King. It was masterful. It was joy to the world, combined with portions of the Hallelujah Chorus. Tell me, is this something he just comes up with on his own? Does he run it by you? Do you give him ideas? Or how does this work? Usually usually early summer uh, or, or late spring, Rick will ask me, uh, what direction we're headed. And uh, in this particular case, I knew that we were going to be uh, telling the story or or uh, parts of the story of Handel's Messiah. So I just said, this is what we'll be doing. And uh, uh, Rick show, came up with this wonderful uh, arrangement that, that uses many of Handel's themes, plus a few other composers as well. Mm -hmm. He has this wittiness to his mastery. That he does. Just when people are listening and they hear it, they just, oh, oh, that's so amazing. And I have to tell you, um, I did a few years ago suggest that Richard Elliott wear holiday themed socks <laughs> so that when we take pictures of the footwork <laughs> at the organ, that we could have a, a, uh, a chuckle. But he I doesn't say, do I, that. I don't, I don't know if that will ever quite happen. No, it's not going to happen because he told me that, you know, that his feet are his instruments and he actually has to wear socks that fit a certain way in the That's shoes. That's right. And, and the shoes, for sure. I didn't know about the socks, so I, I just learned something right. It all works together and, and we're so glad it does and, and always love to hear his arrangements. Well, it, it always brings the house down and... Uh, Again, it's 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 an element that's looked forward to, including those of us uh, who are on the uh, on the stage. And sometimes, uh, in fact, most years in our dress rehearsal, I'll say, "Rick, we don't want you to play your organ solo because we want to be surprised like everyone else." So much of the time, we don't hear it until that f the first night of performance. So it's it's a surprise for all of us. Well, not only is he a brilliant musician, he's also a showman. He and, is. and I believe yeah. in this one he stands up on the organ pedals at the end of the number. <laughs> so I mean he's just he's he's the whole package. And always a showman with the very best of taste. Exactly. And sometimes those two don't go together. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, for those who haven't heard him at the organ, let's listen to Let Earth Receive Her King. At the heart of the entire concert is this centerpiece called For Unto Us. Actually goes for almost a full 30 minutes. It is a masterful story of Handel's Messiah, which many people are not familiar with. He had a lot of challenges when he set out to write Messiah. I think most people who know a little bit about Messiah know that it was written in a very short amount of time, which in and of itself is quite miraculous when you consider 
the how much music there is and the quality of the music as well. Uh, but uh, most people don't know, I think, uh, as you said, the, the, there, are, there are various aspects to the story of Messiah that are quite remarkable. Our particular take was uh, how the work became an act of charity yes. in, in, in its, uh, certainly during uh, Handel's lifetime and then continued uh, after that time as well. And there was a wonderful parallel in the retelling of the story of Messiah, of how what he did in his life is really mirrored in what Christ did in his life and helping the downtrodden and, and reaching out to others, particularly the poor and those who do not have family. And that, especially for Martin Jarvis, who was the acclaimed British actor of screen and stage, who was our narrator for the story, uh, talked about during the press conference that he, he really felt the emotion of his performance in telling that story because it had these unique parallels to the life of Christ and was so beautifully interwoven with the music and the arias of our four metropolitan Yes. Soloists at the yes. time. So not only was there this story going on, but we had these beautiful uh, arias that were being sung that were these moments throughout to help the music bring the story into our hearts. That's right. How was that originally conceived? How did that come together? Again, it was an idea. And, uh, and actually, uh, I think you had talked about that for a number of years. I remember it's been stewing for well, a while, but the timing uh, the, again the, was, I, the idea was has right. been there for a while. Yeah. Uh, yes, it had. Uh, but as I said previously, uh, over the last two years, really, we've been working on a new recording of the complete oratorio, which we were just completing at a, uh, about the same time that all of this came together. And uh, uh, my worry was that uh, I knew that this could not be, uh, this story could not be told in 10 minutes, that it would, it would take longer than that. And so my worry was that uh, it might be too long and, and maybe not hold people's attention. But I think all of the elements came together. And again, uh, I have to thank uh, David Warner, who wrote a brilliant uh, script for this and, and conceptualization of how it should be presented. I think, I think we can say we've had many great narrators over the years, but Martin Jarvis was really the right one for this moment. I mean, he really brought the story he, to life. He brought you know, his, his own career, which is in not only uh, theater and movies, but also a lot of radio work. And of course, in radio work, you have to be able to use your voice only to uh, portray whatever you're doing. And when, when uh, uh, he agreed to do this, we just knew that, that we were perhaps, again, on the road to success. And he was very musical in the way he delivered the text. He really interacted with the orchestra. In fact, I, the... I, I mentioned that to several people, that he, he was so musical that him, himself that his instincts kind of knew exactly what to do and uh, when to do it. And he truly felt the the impact of narrating the life of Messiah. Uh, he commented in interviews after uh, just how moving that was for him, and, and he was able to translate that emotion into something that really was successful. Well, if I remember correctly, he he said several times that that this... Uh, information that he was presenting was new to him as well. And so uh, I should also mention our, our four soloists who were, who were wonderful. Uh, our, our soprano was Aaron Morley. Mezzo-soprano was Tamara Mumford. And both, both uh, Aaron and Tamara are originally from this area and now having, of course, uh, uh, great careers uh, throughout the world and, and, and certainly... Uh, Part of that is singing it to the, the Met. And then our, our uh, tenor and our bass were new singers to us, uh, Ben Bliss and uh, Tyler Simpson, but they were 
they couldn't have been better. And uh, not only that, but they were they were wonderful to work with. And so we it was really a, a, a delight to to be able to work on this and put it together. As course, of course, with as with everything that we do, we put it together right at right at the last minute. Yeah. And so you always keep your fingers crossed. But uh, I always say, if you're well prepared, then then uh, other elements will take over. As you said, Martin Jarvis said this was new material to him, but also for the soloists, um, they had not presented Messiah in this way before. And That's in fact, right. Aaron Morley said uh, in an interview that the first time they sang Hallelujah Chorus and the audience in the conference center came to its feet, and this is 20,000 plus people, she actually was overcome with emotion because... All of these people were standing and unified through music. And isn't that what it's all about? Absolutely. And it just was a, another phenomenal moment in the concert. Let's listen to For Unto Us. And if for unto us was not enough, the concert followed up with one of my favorites, the Wexford Carol. And once again, this is a piece that harkens back to the 12th century. Another very soul-stirring piece of music. How can you follow up the Hallelujah Chorus? And yet you do so in, in a majestic way, but it brings us back down into a more personal realm. Is that what you were trying to accomplish? Yes, we knew after Messiah and the Hallelujah Chorus, the only place that you can go is to go very, very intimate. Mm -hmm. And uh, this particular carol, I, I had set this carol several years ago for a different concert, but uh, I decided to take a, to make a, a different uh, take on, on the carol itself. And uh, I've always loved this carol. It's a it's it's one of the beautiful. You would call it a folk carol because its similarity to folk to a folk song is is very similar. And uh, it's one of my favorites of your arrangements too. And in a way, for me, it almost creates some bookends with the concert with "Of the Father's Love" and this. That's it, right. They both that's feel right. very there, historic. There is a similarity. And You're through, right. Through the centuries, it kind of ties everything together from what we felt at the beginning. I think. And once again, the costuming through the centuries, you get this very vast feel, but then a very personal feeling as well as how it relates to you. And I think that's what made the concert so extraordinary. And I hope that's what you were trying to accomplish, because if it was, it was very, very successful. Sometimes you don't know quite what you're trying to accomplish till it's <laughs> over with. So we're, we're glad if it succeeded. I think we all agree that the Wexford Carol is one of our favorites. So let's listen to it right now. Concerts, as long as I can remember, and I have been coming to the Christmas concerts for over a decade, have always ended with Angels from the Realms of Glory. How did that tradition get started, and why is that the song to end each concert with? We, we, we kind of have, uh, if, you, if you'd say there's a, a, a traditional part of our concert every year, it's this ending. We usually... Uh, uh, the choir will usually sing something a little more intimate, and then that leads us into the most, really the most important part of the evening, which is the reading of the Luke story, which, of course, this year Martin Jarvis again did uh, in a very beautiful and significant way. And uh, I did this arrangement originally to the words angels we have heard on high uh, many years ago, and uh, we did it when I when I became 
uh, a part of the Tabernacle Choir uh, musical team. We did it, uh, we used it for one of our Christmas concerts early on, probably uh, 1999, maybe even 2000. And uh, it's sort of hard to come up with anything else that, that, uh, that, does, the that does the same thing. And the, the thing that I find interesting about it is that uh, almost every guest artist that we've had comes in and, and gives a, 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 their own take, yes. if you will, of the carol. And, uh, uh, and it's, there's always dancing each year, too, which is always presented differently that's depending right. on the concert. That's right. And uh, so there are things that make it its own, unique to the concert, but that tradition is there throughout the I years. I think tradition is important. We, we, uh, we always like to see new things and, and experience new things, but traditions are important, whether they're traditions in our, our, uh, in our homes or... Uh, musical traditions, and this has just kind of become a tradition over the years. And sometimes I think, oh, maybe we should, maybe we should change and do something else. But can never quite come up with the right, right uh, idea that does the same thing, if you will. Well, as a fan of the choir, don't change. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do love it. I look forward to it as the the concluding. Well, moment we know, we with know the, the concerts at an end when you when you hear the those first strains of the, of the carol. And it is different every year. So let's listen to the choir and Laura Osnes singing "Angels from the Realms of Glory." This concert really was one about goodwill towards all men, about celebrating the life of Christ and how that's been celebrated through the centuries and how it all brings us together in unity. How did you come up with the title Hallelujah? Is that the exclamation point on all of those themes? Again, it just seemed like what else could it be but Hallelujah? Well, it not only tied together the, the Messiah element of the program, but just the, again, the general feeling of exclamation. Yeah, that, that there, there, we, we, there were several uh, ideas that we thought about, but uh, this, this just, even though it's only one word, it, it as Ryan said, captured the, the spirit of, of this concert. Wow, thank you so much for making this concert available to everyone through the CD and through the DVD. I, for one, just totally lost myself listening to it and watching it and reliving the concert. It really is such a special concert in so many ways and so unique that we encourage everyone to have the opportunity to be a part of Hallelujah. Thank you, Mac. Wilberg, thank you. Ryan Murphy. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Oh.